Gamers Podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. I pray you're all well and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Now, you may all be wondering, where's Aki? Uh, he's been very busy, a new dad, um, some other life responsibilities, but he will be back soon, inshallah. He misses you guys as much as you all miss him. Um, and today, episode along with all the episodes this month is in partnership with family breaks which is an islamic retreat for families and children uh, to enrich themselves spiritually inshallah the details will be at the bottom of the screen please check them out www.familybreaks.org.uk today's guest brothers and sisters um, is someone who's very dear to me uh, someone who i regard as a teacher a mentor an advisor a brother and a friend uh, and it's someone who has, of late at least, has been shaping the way I understand uh, and you know convey uh, Ottoman history, something which is, is a great passion and an area of interest for me. And that is none other than Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> How are you? Um, I'm great. Um, you're here in the UK for a short stay. Yeah, I am. I came to see my father. So do you regard the UK as home or Turkey as home now? You know, I used to say home is where your mother is. Okay. Um, now I say home is where you live. Okay. So I live in Istanbul. So uh, Turkey's home. Yes, it is home. Yeah, if it was actually, um, I was looking at a couple of my students' uh, Instagram feed and I was missing it. So, yeah. Does Pakistan have a place that could be regarded as home in your heart? Honestly, um, Pakistan as a place, I would like to hope so, but I haven't been in Pakistan for a long time. But emotionally and culturally, still I'm attached to Pakistan just because that was the prevalent culture in my household. So... Um, I come from a place of multiple, I mean, look, Syria's in my place. I mean, I used to live in Damascus. For how long? Three years of my life. And so every single place I've been to, it's left a mark on me, it leaves an imprint, and you have an affinity to that place. Damascus was beautiful. I mean, I, um, it's a shame, yeah. Yeah. So let me kick off today's podcast by first asking you um, five questions. Go for it. Now, I know academics have a problem not only with word limits, but yeah. generally sometimes they tend to uh, go off on one, but that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, but because I do like the sound of your voice, I may allow I you. Tell you. Me, thanks. <laughs> so <laughs> let me ask you some five questions. If I can have some short, succinct answers. Okay. And then perhaps we can elaborate on it later on sure. in the podcast. If you had to share mm. a seven day boat ride yeah. with one of the Ottoman sultans from the 36, I believe, that existed, yeah. who would it be and yeah. why? It has to be Abdul Hamid, right? Okay. It has to be Abdul Hamid. I mean, I'm a 19th century historian. Yeah. And uh, I would be intrigued in how he felt when it was all falling apart. After holding it together for that long. Interesting. Um, one of the, name me the greatest single achievement of the Ottomans. What do you think? The greatest single achievement? For sticking around for that long. Transformation. Being able to uh, reinvent themselves for 600 years. Your biggest single critique of the Ottomans? Collapse. Um, one of the most defining battles in Ottoman history. Uh, Istanbul. Friday, uh, 1453. And as a historian, which other historian in, 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 in the field of Ottomans do you rate and regard and recommend? Oh, that's a, uh, so I have a... Okay, this is personal, but I have a friend of mine who's very dear to me. His name is Abdul Hamid Kermazur. Okay. And um, he's not only a historian, he's a brother to me who took care of me in Turkey throughout my time there. So if I were to pick one, he yeah. would be the one. Okay, mashallah. Now, you're currently a lecturer in University of Istanbul, right? Yeah. And which in department? Theology. Okay. Yeah. But fundamentally, you are a British-born Pakistani yeah. from South London. Yeah, that's right. So what possessed you, first and foremost, to choose Ottoman history as an area to, spe to specialise in? How much time do you have? Bismillah, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm sure you can deliver it in a, in a very economical way. It's a difficult one. So actually, I'm not only Pakistani, my dad's from Uganda. So um, we have this mixed background, uh, mixed cultural background. A British Deshi. Yeah, yeah, um, you're right. Um, so when I was living in Syria, um, I was studying Arabic and I had a friend, um, Abdurrahman, and he was a, a convert to Islam and he was studying Ottoman history. And I used to speak to him because I found it... Um, Quite strange that at the time, the, a lot of Ottoman buildings were being hidden and so forth. And the Ottoman memory was being like phased out in Syrian society because they had a... To build the Syrian nation state, you have to, had, you have to create a, a narrative of the past that's been decadent so that you can create the 
the, the flourishing of a new nation state, right? So, so this was a Ba'athist policy? Yeah, but it's not only a Ba'athist policy, this is a policy of Arab nationalism in particular, so okay. it was across the board. Um, it's not only that, it, I mean, this happened in the Balkans as well. So um, for me, I remember seeing like this famous market called Sukh al-Hamidiyya, uh, which is named after Sultan Abdul Hamid II, mm. and his, his Torah, his cipher was mm. on the wall. Um, and Damascus is, is great. I mean, you see tombs of Salah Adin, you see, um, you know, um, Muawiyah is buried there, Yazid is buried there, Bilal Radil Al-An is buried there. Um, it, it's amazing, like the city is just a gold mine. Um, but one of the things I noticed was this sort of like lack of investment in the Ottoman past, which frustrated me a little bit. Um, but that's not why I, was, I went to study it. I actually came home because my mother was sick um, and I decided to do a master's and I took a course at SOAS and I loved it. Um, but I also recognized the fact I had so my, my brain was like Dutch cheese, just so many holes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's going on here? And then, you know, the, the Bernard Lewis question, what went wrong? Mm. And I think a lot of Muslims felt that way. What went wrong? What, mm. What's happening here? And seriously, at the time when I was studying my master in 2007, I was the only Muslim in the class. Really? Yeah. yeah. And um, I remember Muslims just not caring. It, it wasn't only Ottoman studies. Just Islamic studies in general? Yeah, by and large. Um, I remember going to my local masajid and even in the seminaries, Muslim scholars not interested in Islamic history and... Uh, so uh, why do you feel that is? That's a good question. Why, why do you feel that there is? I, I know because I've observed it as well. Yeah. Uh, theology, jurisprudence is alive and kicking. Right? Yeah. But when it comes to Islamic history, from the perspective of identity and revival, mm. there does seem to be a disconnect amongst ulama of all theological schools and backgrounds. Yeah. I'm not saying they all are, but I, I've observed it. Why yeah. do you think that is? No, it's a valid observation because when you see in, in the past, like if you read a tabari or so forth, um, the ulama were the ones who were writing history. So they were writing history as Muslims for Muslims. And something's gone wrong in the 19th century onwards. I mean, we have in the Ottoman space, we do have it in Arab history in particular, that ulama were writing. But something happens after World War One where um, the space is diminished. I guess the ulama, I, I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, and I'm more than happy for them to criticize me here, are more concerned in trying to save the, the more what they would call pure sciences for them. Mm. Um, history took a back seat. Mm. And then gradually, history became the domain of Western academia. And it, it's, I mean, in England and the United States, the humanities is the space or was the space for intellectual sort of like um, investigation, right? Mm. And for them, historians and people who did those subjects were the ones who made uh, intellectual inquiry about society, civilization, and so forth. Mm. We lost that somewhere. I can't put my finger on it in, in all honesty, but... I think we need to have a conversation again about, look, everything needs context. Yeah. Um, so even like Quran needs hi historical context, right? So I, when I was in High Wycombe recently, I was explaining to them, look, when, um, let's look at the first word of the Quran, it's Iqra. Yeah. Right? So Jibreel alayhi salam comes to Rasul salam and says, Iqra bismi rabbika lasi khalaq. The word Iqra, when you ask people in English, what does it mean? They'll say it means to read. Mm. And indeed it does. So the Quran, the word Qur'an, qara'a, mm. comes from the word iqra. Mm. So the Qur'an, from the first word we know now, it's going to be something that's going to be read. Yep. The first word yep. is sufficient to tell us that this is going to be a book. It's quite intriguing for me, right? Mm. Alright, so when Jibreel alayhi salam is telling Rasul salam iqra, he didn't write on the wall with chalk in the cave, iqra bismi rabbi kalasi khalaq. The narrative goes that he squeezed Rasul squeezed, salam. Yep. So what's he asking Rasul salam to do? To recite. To recite. Yeah. So Iqra means to read, mm. Iqra means to recite. But when Rasul Sallam is saying, for example, I'm Ammi, I mean, I can't recite this. Yeah. I mean, what does he mean he can't recite? Recitation is easy. Like when I went to Madrasa to learn Quran, mm. I learned from the recitation model. Yeah. The Imam would say, Iqra bismi rabbi kalla si khalaq. Yeah. And then you said the same. So what's going on here in terms of Rasul Sallam saying Sorry. that he's, he's not literate? Mm. Well, the interesting thing is, is Rasul Sallam is listening to Quran for the first time. He's the first human being to hear Qur'an. He's hearing miracle of Allah Ta'ala. Mm. That is fascinating for me. So there was a scholar in Syria, I mean, and a friend of mine, Ahmed, he highlighted this to me, that there was a scholar, Hassan Habanaka. He says that Iqra can also mean to understand. So now, if we read it, Iqra bismi rabbi kallazi khalaq, understand in the name of your Rabb that you were created from khalaq. Mm. That makes sense now. Okay. Because you're being taught something here. So why am I highlighting this to you? So the first word of the Qur'an means to read. Yeah. The first word of the Qur'an means to recite. The first word of the Qur'an means to understand. understand. The first word of the Qur'an has told you how to interact with the book. One word. 
it's sufficient. Yeah. Here you start to see language is important. And what you understand is the power that's speaking to you is Allah Ta'ala. Yeah. So here now it's amazing, like one word is sufficient to relay this whole thing, right? And for me, like when I when I look at Quran like that, and I think well Muslims are not even interacting this narrative of Sirah mm. with Quran. Mm. Right? So put Ottoman history to its side, even when I'm teaching Sirah or Sallam, we we can see that Muslims they they haven't even invested in that, that basic foundation. And the Sirah is beautiful. Um, there's a lot of pain and difficulties in it. And if you're going to, I've always said this that if you're gonna read Sirah, you cannot read Sirah without reading Quran at the same time. Because the Quran is the biography to some degree of Rasul Sallam. It's actually telling us this. So um, it's not just Ottoman studies here. Something's gone horribly wrong. Um, how do we change that? I guess we've got to vocalize it first. Are we in a state of intellectual decline? I don't know if we're in a state of intellectual decline, but there's definitely an intellectual deficit. Okay. Um, there's a deficit of leadership too, and there's a deficit of intellectual leadership. So what made you then do this master's? And what was the specific masters you did in? Uh, Near Middle Eastern studies. Okay, and then and then from um, how did that then become transpired to you going off to Turkey and teaching Turks about their own? One could argue. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't like the term noise, yeah. but teaching the Turks about their own. Why didn't you stay here mm. and teach the Muslims here about Ottoman and Islamic history? Well, I just loved it. Okay. I just found it fascinating initially. Yeah, I was a Muslim going, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to do the PhD because I just. I find academia difficult. People are going to be surprised. I hate reading. I hate the library. I hate writing even more. Do you, do you like Instagram stories? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, calling me out. Yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm an serial Instagrammer. Uh, but I'm not in them. Yeah. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but um, something happened where, um, okay, I was a bit of a storyteller. And I enjoyed telling these stories to my friends. And I remember the trigger was when I said, a friend of mine said to me, Oh, is Abdul Hamid II the Sultan that comes after Salah Adin Ayubi? Oh, good Lord. Right, that sounds bizarre for you right now. But, <laughs> it, but nobody knew who the Ottomans were. Nobody knew who the Mughals were. And we were talking earlier, even West Africa, there's so much of this Islamic history that's missing. Mm. Anyway, so I got on with my life. I was busy and so forth. And I went to a talk. And my supervisor at the time had seen me at the talk pulled me over to her side and goes, why are you not pursuing this? You, you loved it. I said, this is a privilege. I don't have the money for it. Um, and I don't come from a privileged background. I come from a working class background. Mm. Um, I'm a single mother working in a factory, holding down two jobs. And she did fantastically well in terms of raising two kids. And um, I just thought, that's not for me. Um, you know what I did? I saved money and I did it. Um, and then I realized that history is not about storytelling, it's ideology, it's power, it's narrative. Um, it, it's something much more than that, it's machinery. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing the PhD, um, when I went to Turkey initially to present my work, I was actually, some scholars, not all scholars, some were really warm, but others was quite skeptical. A Muslim, non-Turkish Ottoman historian coming, yeah, it's, coming it's, into the scene. It's weird because it, it, that can be taken from a historian who was white, and I don't want to play the race card, but it can be taken. For, but when I was doing it, it was a little bit difficult. And I did often get questions, not only from the Turkish community, by the way, from the indo pak community too, that why don't you just study about the Mughals? Why are you studying about the Ottomans? And that's a bizarre question, because I always say to Muslims, just study everything. Yeah. Study French Revolution. I don't care what you study, just study it, mm. right? I just took an interest in Ottoman history. Um, but why? Why Ottoman history? Why not Abbasid history, Umayyad history, because Ayyubid it, history, Mughal history? I guess the 19th century was so fresh. I think World War I was fresh. I think the collapse of the Ottomans was fresh. I think I could see history manifested in Istanbul. I could see it everywhere. And I, I guess the ideas that I was studying at Saras for my masters at the time, those debates and discussions hadn't changed. They were talking about justice, they were talking about Islam, they were talking about Islamic revivalism, they were talking about power, authority, agency, would you colonialism. Say, would you say Muslims were widely absent in those discussions? Not amongst themselves. It was there, it was quite vibrant. But something's happened where we don't know those discussions anymore. So we bring to the table like where these geniuses that are coming out with something fresh and new and people have discussed it 200 to 100 years ago. Mm. And I just thought, whoa, okay, what's going on here? Okay. Oh, Subhanallah, sorry, you meant that these discussions were taking place 100, 200 years ago? Yeah, in the Ottoman domains. Yeah, and many scholars, thinkers, intellectuals mm -hmm. had put, put this forward. And for me, that was like, okay, what can I take from this? What can I learn from this? How can I internalize this? Should I internalize it? What does this mean for, for me as a Muslim? I mean, I'm a historian who believes that Muslims should just invest in Islam. 
Mm. Okay, there's a difference between the studying of what Muslims do, which is by and large the discussion we'll have today. But then there's a, the study of Islam itself, mm. right? And I'm an intellectual historian, so I'm more interested in ideas. So then ideas are, can be quite independent. And then how can you make these ideas more vibrant and relevant today? And ideas are built on ideas, right? So nothing comes from a vacuum. And even in Islam, we say, you know, Allah Ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of things. And mm. then people built on that. Yeah. So what can I build on a history that existed 100, 200 years ago, of which now I believe strongly that we have a collective amnesia of? Um, and is it relevant? And I think it is relevant. And remember, the Ottomans are not just Istanbul. It's the Balkans, the Arab provinces. It's Africa. And I it's said three, this, It's three continents. Three continents, yeah. And I told you before, Africa is a Muslim continent for me. Yeah. So um, we got to stop looking at the Ottomans as Turks. Yeah. And it's more than that. Now, why did I go to Turkey? Going back to your point. Why didn't you stay here and pursue, and pursue these studies here? If you felt like there was also a need for Muslims, non-Turkish, British Muslims to also yeah. reconnect with this history. I think it's a fair charge made in my direction. Um, yes. I'm not going to um, I'm not going to try to make excuses for that. My personal rationalization at the time was one, I could go to Turkey and learn more about Ottoman studies for myself. But when I lived in Syria, I noticed a brain drain in Syria, which really hurt me. And I became invested in the region and I wanted to stop that in Turkey, too. OK. And actually, I started to think a bit bigger in terms of the Ummatic paradigm. OK. In terms of I think we need to have that conversation about what the Ummatic paradigm means to us. I mean, you have your own local um, dynamics. But what does local mean? So I live in Tooting. It's local Tooting. So when I went to my local masjid, they said, you know, he, he's back. Um, and then I went to High Wycombe to give a talk and they said that was local like he, he's from England yeah, yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? And then when I go to um, the people speaking to Indian Pakistan Bengali background, he's local. Oh, he's one of us home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then <laughs> Turkey, he's one of us. He's Muslim. Of course oh. he is. He's, he's one of our scholars He's not an outsider and I've, I've won many people over So I think that conversation needs to be had in terms of what when we're looking at this Ummatic paradigm So I've said this before that when Rasulullah says Ummati, Ummati in his, the famous hadith, yes. he's not talking about just the Ummati right now, he's talking about Ummati in the time, in the, right? In the future, yeah. So, what we've done is we've boxed ourselves into the Ummah of today. We've actually taken ourselves to be far more important. And we don't realize that there's an Ummah of the past that has restricted us of what it means to belong to the Ummah. Mm. And then there's an Ummah of the future that we can't even see it, mm. right? So, what does it mean to belong to that Ummah? Um, that we can't imagine. So we have a responsibility not only of the Uyghurs, the, uh, the Warringas, Syrians, and you know, or Kashmiris, Muslims, Palestinians, Palestinians, Palestinians so Muslims in Africa, know. Muslims in, in the West even. We have to have a responsibility of an Ummah that can exist in one, two, three, four hundred years time, an mm. imagination. Mm. So my argument has always been that our imagination is myopic, which means myopic means we can only see in front of us. So mm. that means we have now a really poor understanding of the past, and we don't have any imagination of the future. It's colonized. Are, the, are those two things linked? Yes, of course they are, because you have to place yourself in a timeline of history where you're at. Mm. So how do you fit? So once we were talking about Ottoman history, and then I said about Rasul Sallam, yeah. how do you, how is Rasul Sallam relatable for you? Mm. How are the Umayyads relatable for you? How are the Abbasids relatable for you? How are the Seljuk Turks related, or the Ilhanis? How are the Mughals related? How are the Muslims in China? at the time uh, relatable to you how are the muslims in africa this all matters mm. in terms of how you place yourself in, in those relationships human relationships and islam and then what sort of imagination do you have for the future so i said this before when you watch movies um you, back to the future is what my students were saying what i said what's the future going to be like there's mm. hoverboards flying cars is that what they think that's what they think or they have a dystopian understanding terminated you know the terminators are coming mm. blade run and so forth where's islam in the conversation it's just not there so you can see is Islam is totally taken out of the imagination. For them, Islam is a service for them. And that's very concerning. For me as a historian, definitely. Yeah, so yeah, now yeah. when you're asking me in terms of a historian, um, why is history important? That's why it's important because we intellectualize that space, right? And if you look at people like um, uh, Ibn Khaldun for in particular, he was a visionary. Yeah. When his book is still can be read today. Mm. Al Ghazali, you still read his works today because writing is timeless in that sense. Yeah, and they, it's the Ummatic paradigm for them. Yes, Fatawa culture is local. Yeah, but generally, when you're writing from the Ummatic paradigm, it's timeless. Yeah, yeah, right. And it transcends regions, right. generations. So that imagination needs to exist, and imagination isn't wrong. The Quran gives you imagination when Al Ghazali says, "And Nuh alayhi salam, you are there." And Musa alayhi salam, and Jannah looks like this, this, and this, and Jahannam is like this, this, this. So something's happened there where Muslims have just become so present in like thinking within the present context and that concerns me so when i went to turkey 
I didn't see myself now as a British Muslim anymore. I, I, I find that problematic to even coin that. I, mm. I, I was just Muslim. Okay. And yes, don't I, get me wrong, there are some challenges. Of course, people are going to ask you. Like, and you what from? are those challenges? What kind of challenges have you found mm. as a... Look, mm. the, I don't like these labels of stud, yeah? Sure. But the thing is, they are what they are. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you are a non-Turk yeah. from the UK mm -hmm. that's gone to Turkey to oh. essentially teach uh -huh. the Turkish Shabab about their history, yeah? yeah? yeah. Or was perceived widely as their history, yeah? Yeah, yeah? What kind of challenges have you faced? Well, first the question is, just, uh, how British am I? Yeah. You know, we're still having this question right now. Yeah. What does it mean to be British? Um, look, when I went there, I actually loved it initially. So whenever someone challenged me, yeah. I thought, you know, I'm going to show you. Okay. I'm going to let you know. Listen, look, this is, because I believe that that history belonged to Islam. Bit, in the sense that it's Islamic history and it's taught in Western academic spaces, which talks about Islamic history from a particular <coughs> point of view and power. And then the only other group of people that write about Ottoman history are by and large Turks and then people in the region. And I just thought, why are we as Muslims not invested? So I went in there to be part of the bigger fraternity. Language is a barrier. Culture for sure is a barrier. But even the way that academia is done, it's done differently in Turkey than it's done in um, the United Kingdom in America and Europe. What's even interesting is Arab scholarship on Ottoman history is, is really terrible actually it's quite appalling and then in the Balkans there's a problem because all of these identities come from this space yeah in fairness the Turks have done the best in that sense and the Turks actually seriously they do a lot of good work Alhamdulillah. and but it's a different form of scholarship it's done in a different way uh, give me an anecdotal example or, or what, what one one kind of difference so the Turks I guess it's maybe unfair but they don't do grand narrative anymore okay they, it's very data driven periodic not necessarily periodic but the data is important. The, the resources, okay. they, they, what they have is resources. So, so when did they ship? When did they move away from the grand narrative kind of approach to history, uh, Ottoman I, history? I don't know if they. I think in the sixties and seventies they were doing grand narrative. Yeah. And then, like, unless it was established that this is what the grand narrative is, and revisionism is very, very difficult to do. Mm. Um, but maybe one of the, the challenges could be because revising that means to you revise your own identity, mm. right? So I've said this before, as historians, we're kind of time travelers. Okay. We go back in time, we change your history, it changes who you are today. Yeah. It changes your memories. Um, they publish a lot of works. It's really hard to keep up, actually. Okay. Um, their publications are intense. How long did it take you to learn Ottoman Turkish? I think I'm still learning. You're still learning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough. Um, I think I'm still learning Turkish. I think I'm still learning Arabic. I think the language learning doesn't stop. Um, Is knowing Ottoman Turkish a a, a, a key to actually accessing the depth of Ottoman history in, yeah. terms, of data, in terms of actual primary source yeah, data? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, it's a language of power to some mm. degree and it's an interesting form of power. I'll give you an example why I mean by power. So while the Ottomans are using Ottoman Turkish or Smanlıca as we say, mm. um, but you know, like, so colonial languages, they dominate other languages. Ottoman Turkish didn't do that to other languages. In fact, Ottoman Turkish was negotiating with Persian and Arabic, which is very rare to do for a power of coloniality. Or so it, power. Inc it included those languages it within? Not, it not only includes it, it, it really allows it to flourish within it. So, okay. I mean, one of the arguments I make, for example, is like if Quran, so Quran elevated Arabic. So Arabic existed prior to the revelation. Yeah. Quran took it to a next level. Quran takes it to a next level, yeah. right? And then Quran does that to Islamicate languages. Yeah. So Islamicate languages are those languages which were used by Muslims. So Urdu, Farsi, Persian, Jawi, um, Albanian, mm. Mal you know, you name it. Yeah. And those languages used to be written in Arabic script. Mm. Um, and they had a lot of loan words that were from Arabic or Farsi. Or they had indigenous words that had become Islamized. Yes. So Islamicate languages literally submitted to Islam. Yeah. Right? And so even if you look into those Islamicate languages, you find a lot of Islamic nuance that can just be understood from feeling. Mm. So salah and namaz, yeah, they translate course. smoothly. Yeah, of course. So there's not, but salah and prayer, they don't translate as smoothly. Absolutely. Okay, so then the non-Islamic languages like English, French, German, they're generally considered as the modern languages. So this is quite intriguing, right? Mm. And these modern languages, by and large, still find it difficult um, to to grasp that nuance that's in the culture. Like I said, those languages submitted to Islam. And so when you read those languages, instinctively, you start to get a different essence of what's been said. Sometimes, just by the mannerism of the author, you get an Islamic essence that is really hard to translate 
into like a Western language. So how, so how has this issue of language affected the way in which Ottoman history is being taught and learnt? Because from what I'm, what I'm gathering from what you're basically alluding to, is that the very fact that it, today's history and 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 and, and academia is taught in the English language, right. which, which is a, which was a language of power, yeah. and therefore when that language is used to then convey and teach and disseminate history, mm. that too comes from a biased and problematic position. Yeah, I mean, look, th there's been some fantastic works in English. I think English as a language of medium of power needs to be. Taught. I mean, I think Muslims need to learn English now because the access of information is English. But also when you're a historian, for example, um, you need to have access to the language of the people at the time. Mm. And very few of us have access to that information because it's just been cut off. Right. So the Turkish Republic is formed. The language is cut off. No one can use that anymore. And when you speak to most Muslims, Alhamdulillah, Quran saved Arabic, actually, because the onslaught in Arabic was the same. Mm. But Quran saved Arabic. And alhamdulillah, in places like Iran and in Pakistan in particular, there was a sort of movement of safeguard in Urdu and, and Farsi. Mm. And now in, when I went to Malaysia, they're trying to revive Jawi. So they have two languages, Malay yeah, and Jawi. Right? Yeah. So Jawi is the Arabic script yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So there are some movements to do that. Um, but it's really hard for Muslims and academics as well to get access to that language. And so then you become disconnected from everything. So now when Muslims are reading about Ottoman history, they're dependent on what? On the mediums that are available to yeah. them. English has become a lingua franca, so they bo read books in English. Mm. All right, fine. That's not a problem until you start to realize Orientalism, yep. ideology, yep. Eurocentrism, and so on. And how does the average reader know how to decipher that information? Which is, which is correct, Islamically, which is incorrect, which is a bastardization of history, which is a distortion, which is an exaggeration, yeah. which is politically yeah, driven, yeah, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah, and uh, that's why... Muslim historians are then needed. Okay, right. so how important? Okay, so we can have Muslim academics. We yeah. have Muslim academics in abundance, mm -hmm. but I think being a Muslim academic is something distinctly different to having an academic who identifies confidently in being Muslim, but also has a grounding in Islam and understanding yeah. their tradition or or understanding their their area of expertise, yeah. right? Because I've met Muslim academics uh -huh. in the work in the work of decolonialism, anti-racism. Islamic history and they too have adopted a very secular orientalist frame in, in understanding history yeah. How important is it would you say to have a kind of good Islamic mm. grounding as a Muslim academic? I just told you Quran is essential to, to our existence And Quran fundamentally has to be the framework from which everything else emanates from So as a historian, if Muslims in the past were writing about Muslims in their capacity as Muslims from the sort of framework or epistemology of Islam then why can't that be done now? So you, so, you, so then therefore Ustad, you are not a normal historian so have you faced issues when you joined this fraternity? There are some challenges, I'm trying to negotiate the two spaces mm. I, I don't know if I've succeeded mm. I mean I've had difficulties just visibly looking Muslim mm. um, To be fair, academia is getting better because more and more Muslims are entering academia and that's great um, But that's just demographic, that's just numbers what, yeah. about, what, what about what about look? We don't want to write anyone off, yeah. right? But but in terms of like, fine, Muslims are joining academia, but the quality of the Muslims and how they're dealing with their respective areas of expertise is also important. It is important. I mean, I can't judge any given academic, but yeah. for myself, what mm. I felt as a Muslim um, was that um, I wanted um, my students to see somebody that was like them. I wanted Muslims who are religious and from a particular framework to find a person. I mean, one of the reasons why I agreed to doing this podcast, because as you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a recluse and I don't do much of this, is that... He's not really, I love him really. Is, um, <laughs> is the fact that um, the charge was made against me that you should be more visible. I uh, said that to you. Yeah, you did. And I appreciate that. No, because I find it frustrating. And I've said this to the other academics who have been on this podcast. That look, whilst I love the work you guys do, and it's so important, mm -hmm. I feel that sometimes these conversations are happening in ivory towers yeah. and, and within your own circles. And the awam to digest, accept, understand, and then use it to revive and awaken is not happening. Yeah. The great scholars of the past were accessible to the ummah. Yeah. The, great, the great scholars of the past were accessible mm -hmm. To the awam And it was those Their ideas And their take On any given uh, issue In society Was what helped society Move and progress yeah. So Whilst you Ustad You've described yeah. yourself As a recluse But yeah. I see value In the wealth of knowledge That you have And it's helped me 
Thank you, I appreciate it. That. It's helped me. So when I have to go and deliver a lecture on Ottoman history in an hour, yeah. which you find crazy yourself, yeah, yeah, I, 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 have to, yeah. I have to come and ask someone and speak to you. But yeah. the thing is, I have this hour or not do it at all. Yeah, yeah. You understand? So I have to choose yeah, the hour. Yeah, it's, no, look, I understand. It's hard. Um, it, it, look, it's just so hard being a Muslim right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, like how, how do you make sense of it? So I was telling you before when we were on our way here that uh, the Miraj story of Rasulullah is beautiful. I mean, like the, the Miraj event in itself, a book can be written on that, right? And I was saying when Rasulullah is going to meet Allah Ta'ala, he says, you know, I see, I saw prophets with thousands of followers, then prophets of hundreds of followers, then prophets with some, and then prophets who had zero. And my students always, what's the deal with the zero followers? And I said, those are the prophets that put dents in society. They were holding the fort. And then when the next prophets came, people ran with it. And um, then I explained to my students that we are all part of a clock. Some pieces are bigger than others, but the clock, all the pieces need to work for the clock to function, right? Maybe I'm a small piece, but I honestly felt, um, so a lot of people don't know this, but I invest in human beings. I'm a big believer. I'm not very good at social media. I'm not very charismatic in that sense. And Check I don't him on Instagram. His Insta stories are sick. <laughs> Carry on. Okay. And uh, my, my, my belief has been um, to invest in, that's what Rasul Salam did. He invested in the Sahaba. He invested in his people, he invested in their spirituality, he invested in them intellectually, he invested them in their motivation, he entrusted, thank you, he entrusted Islam in them, and then he allowed them to run with Islam. They went to Abyssinia, they went to Musab ibn Umar, goes to Medina, Salman al-Farsi, even when he, after he dies, the Sahaba keep continuing. That human investment was necessary. I, I made the decision to invest in people. Um, so in Turkey, I invest in my students. Mm. Um, and I was once asked a question like, you know, you're overworking yourself. And I said, well, we just got to sleep less. Mm. Now, it sounds bizarre. Yeah, I know. But my, my beard has gone crazy. My dad is complaining because I make mm. him look old. <laughs> 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 He's going to put henna in your beard. I was like, no, dad, it's not going to work. Um, but you know, the idea was, and I, I'm really passionate about this, invest in people and let people run with Islam. And they need people, they need a framework. Um, we don't have enough of that. So... I think that's what we've got to try to do, which is ingest in human beings. And as an academic now, I take that charge that you mm. put in my direction. And I say, yes, well done for calling me out on that. Mm. Um, the only thing I'm going to make excuses for is I made a decision to invest in a place like Istanbul. My students are Syrian, Palestinian, um, from the Balkans, not only Turks. So they're not only Turks? No, they're not only Turks. Okay, they're interesting. Kurds and everyone from, from, from the region, because Istanbul is becoming a centre. And then I, I make the decision to move to other Muslim countries. I told you before, I went to Malaysia yep. and so forth, right? The idea is to try to give as much agency to Muslims on the ground because of that brain drain to help them. Because you can bring a hundred students from Istanbul to London, or you can bring one teacher the other way around. Yeah. Now, the charge was made to me that you've abandoned this community. Okay, that's a difficult... Even emotionally, that's been hard for me to balance. It's not just a charge of that. My mum's made a charge against me. You abandoned okay. me as a son, which is even harder, right? Because she has rights over me. Yeah. And um, the harder thing is, is, it's a choice I made and it's a choice my family had to accept. Do you mind if I cite what you told me earlier about your mom struggling to losing her son to Islam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when you say stuff like, I'm, I'm doing this for Dawah, I'm doing this for Islam, I'm doing this for the Muslim community. Mm. Uh, that sounds kind of crazy for very, people. Human beings are practical people. Mm. So this sounds like, you know, what's he talking about? But I will say this, and I appreciate my family's commitment and sacrifice. I think my family's commitment and sacrifice is greater than my commitment and sacrifice because they enough. lost something important. Yeah, I'm the only son in the family, and 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 they lost that. And it's something I have to learn to live with, and it's something that they've had to accept. And but when they came to Turkey, my students said to them, like, we really appreciate having him here. And we're so grateful, and that that was it softened. I mean, two days ago. Many students sent me messages saying, when are you going to come back? It's funny. Um, they start saying, you're coming back, right? Mm. And there's a human emotion in Muslim societies that I like. Here, it's harder. But the decision I've made is, okay, I'm going to live in Turkey. But when I come back to England, then I'm going to try to give as much as I can. So sure. I've been here for two weeks. So And you have been very busy. Yeah, exactly. Meet, meeting and people, that's events, right. podcasts. And, and this is why um, uh, I agree to do this. So I, no, and look, I appreciate it. I appreciate you calling me out and giving me the platform. And I'm very honored to have you on. Um, before we move on to the, the next topic of today's podcast, I want to quickly ask you, um, you said that history isn't just 
uh, a case of reading chronological events and incidents mm. is actually power, it's mm. language, it's ideology, yeah. right? So when one says when one says something like, "Oh, history is written by the victors mm-hmm. or the winners," yeah, mm-hmm. is there some truth to that? Of course, there's some truth to that. Yeah, of course there is. So that then brings to the question then: If I, what is the current state of the quality of Ottoman historians as it stands? I think there are some really good Ottoman historians. Um, I, that's not fair. There's many good Ottoman historians. Would you rate the likes of Quartet and Soraya and these guys? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Their, their commitment to Ottoman studies is fantastic. Cool. Um, the difference between how Muslims see Ottoman history and how Western academia sees Ottoman history, or just academia by and large, is that let's look at Abdul Hamid. Muslims are interested in Sultan Abdul Hamid the person. Academia is interested in the Hamidian period. The whole machinery, that's what they're interested in. And they will go into forensics into trying to find those points. What happened in Yemen? What happened in Syria? What about the women in the Ottoman Empire? What mm. about the paupers? What about, you know, what about cats in Istanbul? You know, mm. it's, it's I'm mm. crazy. Muslims will keep coming to me, Sultan Abdul Hamid. Tell me about the Sultan. And it, it we call it like the great man complex to some degree. And I understand that. Well, I mean, he, was, he, was kind of, he was our great last, last no, great Khalifa. No, yeah, no, what I mean is like the great man complex in terms of Muslims are only interested in leadership. Mm. And like I'm a historian actually of the ulama. Okay, so I'm. But that's because we, we're in need of leadership. Yeah, this is the, well, that's the valid point, isn't it? We're, Which, we're, we're, we're in need of leadership. It's not only that, we, we, we look up to, we, we need role models. Yeah. So we're looking for role models who are in position of authority and exactly. power. Exactly. So, but what I'm saying is it then shows you where the, the scholarship is going. Yeah. So, what I'm trying to do now that I've gone into academia is try to give the, the two. Trying to abridge the two. Yeah. Okay. And, and try to, once. Produce scholarship showing Muslims of the complexity, mm. and two at the same time saying, "Okay, let's look at these sultans themselves, and what can we learn from that?" Mm. And generally, what the idea is, and you said about academics being in ivory towers, what you sometimes sometimes they don't even intentionally put themselves. Yeah, in yeah you're right. They, no, no, they just end up being there yeah, yeah. And, and 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 being like kind of just unaware that they are just having these conversations amongst their own peers in their sure. own language, and and it's not being disseminated sure. to the masses. No, I get that. And so what I'm thinking now. The more conversation I've been having is, and I've been doing this in Turkey, which is how can we take that, come down to, and then pull, pull the society back up, mm. right? Mm. So, those of, so look, Quran is not easy, by the way. You know? So, Quran, no. Kalam Allah is hard. So, what we're trying to do then is we're trying to raise the standard of society. And so, what I'm trying to teach my students in particular, you have to be better than me. Not like me, better than me. Mm. So then, and you instill in the generations after you that they have to be better than you. So the bar is continuously risen. Mm. That means that we have to find a way of building a language which is relatable and accessible and then teach them the complexities. I think human beings can learn complexities. I think human beings are very intelligent. And I think one of the mistakes the Muslim community is doing is it's making Muslims believe that they cannot achieve. That's incorrect. Muslims are no different from anyone else. People are intelligent. Allah Ta'ala created us for crying out loud, do you understand? Absolutely. And he gave us Quran, a very difficult book. And I give an example. When I was studying Arabic, my Arabic teacher used to say, Oh, this language is so difficult. It's like just killed us from the first day. <laughs> and yet Allah says in the Quran that he's made this Quran in Arabic so that you may know yeah. it. Yeah. So what's going on here? So it, you can see the problem that we're having. It's something internalized. So the Ivy Tower, yes, I get, but I think now we have a responsibility of trying to elevate and, and young people do want access to information. Young people do, not only young people, older people, everyone, mm. right? So how can we access the Muslim community first, make them feel motivated, make them feel proud of who they are, and give them that relevant information? And not only Ottoman studies, like I said, they should study everything, go for it, run. Um, I just chose Ottoman studies and I'm trying to make that relatable. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, moving on to uh, an area of Great contention, I would say, with mm. regards to um, how Islamic were the Ottomans, right? Mm. Now, I ask you this because a couple of episodes ago, we had Ustad Adnan Rashid, who specializes mm. in Mughal history, and I, mm. and I posited the same question to mm. him. How Islamic were the Mughals? Now, there's many ways in which you can look at this and yeah. understand this, but the way I have kind of broken it down is to ascertain whether a dynasty or a dawla or a state or something or civilization was Islamic or not, you have mm-hmm. to look at its governance, mm-hmm. laws, mm-hmm. and the kind of predominant values. Would that be a fair kind of assessment? Yeah, okay, okay, I can see so, you so, 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 according to you, uh, and from your reading of and understanding of Ottoman history, mm-hmm. how Islamic were the Ottomans from the perspective of their state, the institutions, the mechanisms, mm-hmm. the laws, the values? If we're making the case, 
Okay, if we're making the case of the Ottomans as a dynasty in regards to how uh, Islamic they were, I think in regards to the sultans themselves, uh, that's an individual issue. Yeah, yeah. I think in terms of the mechanism, in the way that the let's talk about the state. We're not talking about the individual. You know, I mean, you 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 can have a good Muslim ruler, a bad Muslim ruler. I, you can do for me the, the for me the charge. I need to see the charge of why they were un-Islamic. Okay. I I need to see that charge sheet of uh, how, how, what are we, what is the criteria uh, to put forward to to make. The case that the Ottomans were un-Islam I will posit some things to you But yeah. before we get to that Would you say the laws which governed the Ottoman state mm -hmm. Were generally based on an interpretation of Sharia? Yeah, of course they were Yeah, of course they were in they, some, had, they had Sharia courts Okay, in some aspects, in all aspects In all areas of law, in some aspects of law I think what's happening is that there's a constant Islamization As new conditions come in So, but the basis is Islamic now we can nitpick a law here and there as things move on and negotiation takes place. But the basis, the aqidah of that state is Islamic. It's la ilaha. That's well known because look, the notion of deenu devlet. Mm. They have this idea and I'll explain that deen, mm. as we know, deen is the comprehensive worldview of our life. And then devlet is the state whose job is to safeguard the interests of that. Mm. And that was the, the philosophy of the Ottomans. And the way that the Ottomans continuously in the text, uh, sovereignty belongs to Allah. The sovereignty belongs to the Sharia. That was something very consistent, wasn't of it? Of course it was. I mean, they understood. When, so my work, I look at the idea of a constitutional caliphate. Yeah. They understood of holding the caliph to account on the verse in the Quran, which is obey Allah, obey the messenger and those in authority from Muslim. Yeah. And there was a huge debate on this. So mm. that's why I keep... Okay, I, I've said this before, but I'll say it. The Ottoman state was built on three main pillars. The House of Osman, which is the Mulkiya, which is the executive branch. Yeah. The Askariyah, which is the military, yeah. and the Ilmiya, which is the ulama. And these three power configurations work towards the machinery of running the Ottoman domain. The house of the house of so the, so the house of the Ottomans, so the din, the Ottoman lineage, yeah. the military, yeah. and the ulama. Yeah, that's that's a simplistic way of looking at those three entities as the running of the Ottoman like state. And would you say that was very from very early on? Yeah, so one of the points I've made before is that whereas in the Abbasid history the ulama are Presented as people who talk truth to power mm. in the Ottoman state from the inception. The ulama were power. The ulama were part of the power configuration. And that's, and that's a very interesting point. Um, uh, Hussein Yilmaz's book, The Caliphate mm. Redefined, mm. Um, are you aware of this book? Yeah, yeah. So he actually addressed some of these issues where he highlighted distinct differences between the Abbasid Khilafah mm. and the Ottoman Khilafah. Yeah, right. And distinct differences. And he actually went on to say, that whilst, yes, they were indeed mystical and Sufi mm. and of the Sawwuf and mm. Hanafi and Maturi, etc. Mm. He goes, but the state was significantly more comprehensive from the mm. perspective of power yeah. than it was with the Abbasids. Yeah, of course. Right? That's how they survived. Yeah. For, over six, like, right. for a very long time. Yeah. yeah, and the ulama were part of this power configuration. And I've mentioned, um, in this sense, in the Ottoman case, they have something called the Hal Fatwa, which is a state fatwa to remove a sultan. Mm. So there's a fatwa to remove a caliph from power as a sultan, right? Um, that's quite fascinating. They're using something which is coming from Islam today. What kind of things would the what kind of things would the fatwa? So, so for example, f f from the kind of f from the jurisprudence of removing a ruler mm. or re or what justifies his rebelling against it yeah. would be if a khalifa or a ruler commits kufr buah, right? Yeah. How would how would the Ottoman ulama understand a legitimate removal of a khalifa or a sultan? Hey, sometimes it wasn't even that extreme. I mean, <laughs> sometimes it would just be you know the fact that he's wasting money. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, because look, it's an issue of competency. I don't think we've had this conversation enough yeah. regarding Islamic history, which is we talk about the idea that you listen to the Sultan so long as the Sharia is imp implemented. But the Ottomans were also concerned in the practical reasons of like, is he competent? Is he wasting money? Is he forcing the military to just go out and do whatnot? Uh, and sometimes there was even like strange internal dynamics that oh. you can't deny. Um, but by and large, I mean, the, the, the reasons were had to be presented from an Islamic perspective and it had to be accepted from the ulama. Um, and it's a complicated one because then there's the, the Sheikh al-Islam himself and then there's the consensus culture, the ijma culture amongst the ulama. So don't, let's not just assume the ulama in Istanbul. This is, we're talking from Balkans to Cairo to Algeria in the Sulaimani period. That they all played a role in the actual mechanism of the state. Ulama culture is really important in, when we read works of the ulama. They, they are, you know, they're bouncing off each other. So they're not only, so in the 19th century, for example, when mm. I write, um, my work looks at not only ulama in Istanbul, you see ulama in Baghdad, Rashid Rida in, 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 in Egypt, ulama across the board, but ulama in India having a say. So what's interesting about when you became a caliphate city, Istanbul was not an Islamic city, Istanbul was like, in that sense, the Islamic city, mm. right? 
And Muslims outside now have a claim over Istanbul, just like Muslims have a claim over Makkah and Medina. No. So we we have to understand how Muslims are thinking at that time. Makkah, Medina, Jerusalem, the capital of the Khilafah. Yeah. And therefore everyone has a claim to yeah, that. Yeah, now, because today we, we make these decisions that were you born, what, what city were you born in? Yeah, yeah. Like we go as far as saying, oh, why don't you support Chelsea? You live in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you live in London, sorry, right? Yeah. But in those days, it wasn't like that. People didn't have claims over cities in this way. Mm. Now, yes, it's true that Istanbul was still locked off from the rest of the world. But mm. people did have this emotional agency, at least, of writing about what should happen in Istanbul. Mm. And ideas resonated with one another. But, yeah. So, so you're confidently presenting that you're actually, you've actually turned the question the other way around. Mm. You're more interested in what is it that would justify the claim that they were un-Islamic. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let me present a few things to you then, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, it, it, why is it consistently presented that Khalif Sulaiman Rahimahullah mm -hmm. and, and his Qanun and his Canons was the first manifestation of the secularization of Ottoman yeah, law? You need to, we need to, not you, but we need to speak to scholars in Ottoman history who look at the notion of Urf yeah. as a Hanifi tradition in which the Qanun has been placed within the culture of Urf. It's not in contradiction to the Sharia. It could not have been in contradiction of the Sharia for it to survive. Why is it presented as that? Why is it presented as Khalif Sulaiman was the first... Language is one of the reasons. Ideology is another one. Um, it's a little bit sloppy because it's mainly to do with laws of administration. So can you simplify what actually did happen then? What, what, what was it that Khalif Sulaiman... What, what was it that he actually did? That was understood and is being taught currently as something where he secularized law. So it comes under the framework of siyasa. Okay. So it's the prerogative of the sultan himself and okay. what he can do, what he can't do. Okay. In terms of like, let's just say, um, people uh, are committing a particular crime and the Sharia is quite lax on it, but he can say, you know what, this should be the punishment. Um, you can cane these people. Th that's discretion. That's allowed. Yeah, exactly. So that's how. It had, I mean, that's just one example. That predates the Ottomans. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It, it could be another issue to do with. Um, we need to build a mosque here. What does okay. the Sultan say? Okay. Yeah, and he would say, you know, okay, no, we're not going to build mosques at this moment in time. Blah blah blah. I mean, these are simplifications, but the point I'm trying because it's hard to explain to people. But the point I'm making is that it's his prerogative as, as a Sultan, what choices he can make. Now, those are not outside the remit of the Aqidah of Islam. Of course, they're just not. Um, Strictly within the framework of, mm. you know, the the way the fiqh is constructed. Okay. But the, it, Urf is within the fiqh culture. Of course, it is. So it's, it, it's a weak understanding of what Urf is. So Qanun was from the Urfi tradition in that sense. Okay. Um, with regards to, um, <laughs> I'm sorry that I have to mention this, uh, okay. but I did give you a heads up. Yeah. Um, with regards to, uh, sorry. Sh Fratricide. Oh, yeah. That's so, it. why did Ottoman sultans kill their brothers? Yeah, wow, man, because they were crazy. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Look, well, it, it, it's a hard one. As a historian, I remember when I teach this. Who semester, started it? For some people say that it started from Osman Ghazi. Like, really? Far, but yeah. Look, the issue is this: is that the framework is, and I, I was talking about this before. The Mongol invasion is quite devastating, huh? and I'm not trying to make excuses for the Ottomans, but the Mongols, for a prolonged period of time, have decimated a lot of the particular Abbasi and Seljuk culture in regards to... I mean, the Seljuks also had their forms of violence, and so did the Abbasids. But for the Ottomans, the state-building process is important, and they rationalised that a rebellion, like an internal rebellion, which was very real, an attempt of an re internal rebellion, was problematic and then there was a third caveat yeah which is the idea of thinking about doing a rebellion and different sultans for different reasons actually exercised this um, it, it takes prominence on the Fatis period because he's afraid of the interregnum and that happens before where brothers are fighting each other where the three brothers the Sultan Bayezid yeah yeah that's right and this total decimation of the Ottoman identity could have taken place so the idea is is that it's better to have one because they had this first past the post policy, which is the first son who makes it to Istanbul is the, the Sultan and Caliph, or Sultan, and then later comes mm. Caliph, right? And then there's a shift where the Janissaries start to choose. Mm. So the idea is, is that, look, um, these people are going to fight each other and they're just going to, whatever. Um, so if you leave a brother lying around, the, the thinking was, I'm assuming, is that he will raise an army and come to Istanbul. And this internal fighting would just be to the detriment of state society and everything else. From, from my, from, from my uh, limited reading in, in this area, 
um, the kind of early justifications which followed the uh, first interregnum, of the mm. three sons of Sultan mm. Bayezid, it was that um, to avoid rebellion, to avoid civil war, the preservation of the yeah. state and the deen and the ummah, right? Yeah. Now, even in the classical works of our scholars, there is a basis of getting a lot of things which would generally be impermissible, yeah. permissible in for the greater maslaha yeah. of avoiding further bloodshed, uh, the, the the preservation of the deen, etc., mm. etc. But there is a critique culture of this, by the way. There is ulama critique of this. Okay. So it's not just one way or the other. You know this assumption that the Ottomans would do this. And then the point I was making about the Mongol invasion is that the Ottomans do this for a period of time. And then it gets becomes so extreme. Why, why you mention, what, what has the Mongol devastation got to do with fratricide? Well, what it does is it creates a sort of a psyche and memory of a particular form of trauma, which is very violent. And so, I mean, state building is, is a kind of a, a, an aggressive process. Okay, but with the exception to Timur, the Ottomans didn't really feel the brunt of uh, Mo Mo Mongol brutality, did they? Really? But the memory remains. Okay. I mean, you, what I'm saying is like, you don't just come from a vacuum. Okay, so now any state that comes around or any group of people that come around, they've, they're coming from... So this is a Basid state, this is a Mongol invasion, and they're coming from here. And it's, it's devastation. So in, in that context, mm. that, and then it takes a period of time to get to here. And then the Timur aggression happens, which is like devastating for them. And then the internal fighting. So that that whole process, actually, if you keep this constant war and rebuilding, constant war and rebuilding. Um, so that's the psyche. But even they go get to a point where they go too far, and then the ulama say, "Time out. This is out." And I think that's where we should give them the credit. That they did come to a realization. They came to a realization. They came to a realization. This is too far. So when you ask me about Islam, how long does it take for a group of people to realize what they're doing is wrong? It depends. True. But they realized it was wrong. Okay, and uh, uh, and and were they really as creative as killing their brothers with silk ropes, or is this just a myth? Yeah, I don't know. Actually, um, you know, narrative at that time is really amazing in terms of people explaining how people were murdered okay. and. Um, Possibly. Why, why couldn't they just exile their brothers to some faraway province and, and, and let them be the governors there or the leader of a battalion or, 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 or a commandant? Probably because they, those guys would have had ambitions for power, raise an army and come to Istanbul, which has happened. Um, you know, in Jem Sultan's case, he goes to, to Europe, to France, and then becomes hostage to the French. Mm. And now the Ottomans are like sweating and giving back, okay, look, now what? It's funny because they would they would have a problem with them going to France, but they wouldn't have a problem taking them out themselves. It, it's 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 a difficult moment in history. Mm. Now the question goes back to: um, Is that Islamic or not? I mean, clearly there's enough evidence to push that that could be haram or that's problematic. Of mm. course it is. But does that make them un-Islamic in totality? No, that's what I'm saying. Mm. Um, you know, what makes Something un-Islamic For me, Ustad, um, for me, Ustad, I mean, what I mean is a state. Yeah, you know of course. I mean? Yeah, for, so for my understanding, for a state or a civilization to be deemed un-Islamic would mean that its institutions and its source for governance and laws yeah. is not the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ulama, Qiyas, oh, and no, stuff like but this. But this is the thing; they justified it through that. Yeah. So they did have that framework. So, so, so even fratricide had an Islamic justification. Yeah, in a, it. it's strange, in a strange way. And you know what, actually, like, I'm, I'm not going to make excuses for him. I think the ulama today should sit down. Yeah. That's why I was saying, like, we need ulama as historians. I, I would love to see ulama, rather than just saying it's haram, sit down and let's go through the evidences. And this would be amazing that we can actually finally unearth this in terms of how we feel about what was taking place there, how they justified it, from how could you justify it, and so forth. Um, that that would be a more interesting conversation for me. Mm. So um, no, I'm not going to justify some of the things they did, but um, but by and large, I mean the sentiment you can see is still there. I mean, look at the end of the day, uh, and by the way, I'm not belittling the killing of brothers uh. here. Yeah, just just in case viewers and listeners, you're thinking this. What I'm saying is that if the fundamental institutions of a mm. state is still based on Islamic source texts and, and 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 the ulama, yeah. it's very difficult to argue against that civilizational state being un-Islamic. Yeah. As opposed to a, a single policy right. or a single or, or a single act of a khalifa or a sultan. My, my, you know what my concern is with the narrative of fratricide and so forth is that many Muslims would then see that issue and it would shake their Muslim foundations, their Islamic foundations. Say, oh, look what we're doing! Like this is an Islamic uh, Muslims have just been the same as everyone else. Mm. And that's why I wanted to focus on less on the fratricide itself, but on the abandonment of fratricide, which mm. shows that this is a civilization which is changing, evolving, and growing. And it was Sultan Ahmed the first who. who yeah, who, Sultan who, Ahmed. Who I mean, it was him. Mehmed before him who decides, like, we're done with this because okay. uh, Murad just goes, like, okay. goes too far. And it, it shocked everybody. Like, what's going on here? When you say you got too far, what did you do? 
Yeah, he killed a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. Um, eunuchs. Did uh, the Ottomans uh, snip their slaves? <sighs> or did they buy the slaves snipped already? You know, so they, they bought them. Okay. Um, so they bought, the, they bought them snipped? Yes. So they didn't snip them themselves? <laughs> so, um, oh, for those of you who don't know, eunuchs are male slaves who don't have, who have been castrated. Um, Let me just take a sip of water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, okay. It, it, by and large, so there was, they bought them. By and large. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Sounds great. Okay, but you told me something else. You said they would only buy uh, the eunuchs were never black or coloured. No, they were. Yeah, they were from Africa. Okay. They bought them, from, but this was a practice that was done. I'm not justifying it, but this was a practice done in in, in the, by the Sassanids, by the Byzantines, um, by the Umayyads. This was not an Ottoman practice. Well, the Umayyads snipped their slaves as well. <laughs> yeah, this was not an Ottoman practice. This was a practice that predates the Ottomans. And the Ottomans basically, they do this practice when they come to Istanbul. No, the point I'm trying to make is, okay, fine, we know eunuchs existed in previous yeah. civilizations yeah. and dynasties. The point is, that how come they were everywhere in Ottoman palaces? They had really powerful positions, you know. Some of them became Grand Vizier. You know that? Yeah. Because they, they had access to the ears and the conversations of the palace. That's right. That is true uh, in, in that context. So uh, that, that's TK. If you're Tate snooped off, that's fine, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. Yeah, it's it's something that we, we can laugh about it now, but it's serious business. But no, it serious it's a particular business. culture that, um, once again, even I would like to actually. No, honestly, as a historian, because I'm a 19th century historian, mm. so I would like to see what the hell is going on here. Actually, this is an interesting thing. Was it not a case that because they were so close to power, literally living within the yeah, confines right. of power, that they couldn't really get jiggy with the women of the of the sultan? Yeah, of course. That <laughs> that's essentially what it is, right? Yeah, if you're going to put it like that, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> so, um, did eunuchs exist right till the end? Was there at any point they stopped eunuchs? I think they existed even in the Hamidian state. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, the Devisham system. Devisharmet. So, Devisharmet. Oh. So, this for our views and listeners, yeah. this is where uh, the Ottoman state would uh, take uh, one son or a boy from a Christian household. Yeah. Uh, a policy that was generally implemented in the Balkans. Yes. Um, that sounds a tad unfair. Sounds like a state kidnap. Was there any nuance to this law? Oh yeah, like, a lot of people were sending their kids into the death shed system because you understand that, like, children who came out of death shed system. You know, people don't understand Ottoman slavery properly. I give an example. So all a lot of the Ottoman sultans are children of slave women. Right? Of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, the, the, many, the, uh, maybe not the vast, actually, maybe the vast majority yeah. of the mothers of the, the Khulafan sultans were concubines. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? So, the way that they've internalized the notion of like slavery, the Janissaries mm. and so forth, um, they were part of that. So, uh, the way they've internalized and made sense of their world in that context, we have to understand for them, they've seen the world in a totally different way. Um, the Dev Shirmen system was a, a, a privilege based system, which is that you join the Janissary Corps and you get particular privileges. And it was a system that they used, um, yeah, where they took children from but, particular Christian backgrounds. But wouldn't you say, Ustad, that basically when we present this narrative mm. uh, of that policy, that mm. we are merely whitewashing and glamorizing state kidnap? Because that's one of the grievances yeah. which the Serbs, Croats, uh, and other other um, Slavic uh, yeah. and, and, and Christian people from the Balkans, they cite even to today that the Turks yeah, yeah. should kidnap our sons. Now, we appreciate that they went on to do great, to do great and wonderful things. They went to become high-ranking viziers and soldiers, yeah. and etc. We, we, we yeah, accept yeah. that. I mean, look, to, from today's morality, that would look kind of... But at the time, when we look at the way that the world was operating, mm. um, we don't see... I mean, I'm sure people were traumatized that they were losing their kids, but we don't see that level of trauma because even there, we, we see that it was an opportunity for many to, to go into the state system. And the, the main machinery was the state machinery. And to be, you know, imagine having a son who's, who's going into the, the state administration mm. and he's going to have a high-end job. Um, I would like to see as a historian, I mean, there are works on it, but I would like to see how the, the written accounts or just of how people felt. Um, we're, we, we're, we're making this something that's wrong, which is mm. fine. Mm. But what I want to see is, the, the accounts of what people are saying at the time, which would be 
far more interesting in terms of how to make sense of how people were living in those. Periods. No, no, no doubt. I mean, I've read some. I've I've read some yeah. chronicles um, from the Balkans who mm. praised. In, in, in terms of giving their sons away yeah. But I've also at the same hand Also read very sad testimonies Of mothers who are heartbroken yeah, yeah. Uh, about, But you about know what It's no different than a, 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 a state Going to war today And conscription And taking mm. people in And said you're going to have mm. to Join the armed forces And fight for us did, 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 did that policy apply blanket In the region Or were there certain nuances As to when and um, if and when No there were apply? nuances Nothing is blanket in that okay, so, okay so for my Please tell me if you've, yeah. if, if, if you've heard of this before For my Again, my limited reading on basically what Suraya and Cortez and mm. others mentioned was that this policy was was justified mm. in regions, lands, and cities where the Ottomans fought and lost their soldiers in those yeah. in those campaigns. Yeah, that's so, as a kind of compensation, they would then go yeah. on to take. That's but right. where a, where a city, town, or region basically gave and surrendered, yeah. they wouldn't take. Yeah. Some, yeah. Is, is that generally yeah. the kind of that's, justification? That's generally the fair okay, justification. so so it, it can also be seen as state conscription in a way. It can be. I mean, look. Joining the military in any shape or form throughout history, there is a level of um, coercion and, and mm. authority that's, that's exercised. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make understand how that was taking place. I mean, mm. that would have been really fascinating and interesting. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, I'm not going to make excuses for that. Go- going back to something that you wanted to that you mentioned earlier, and I do want you to elaborate on it. Um, one of the kind of accusations that's levied towards um, not just the Ottomans, but the Abbasids, the Umayyads, the Mughals, and and and, and many other Muslim d- dynasties who are Turkic, Persian, mm. Arab, whatever. And that is that. Hey, you guys can criticize the Europeans for the transatlantic slave trade, mm. but the Muslim empires. Mm. And we'll get to the issue of the of the language of empire soon yeah, yeah. later on. But you were also involved in in slave trade. Is there a, is there a difference between the transatlantic slave trade and the slave uh, the, and the slavery that was that the Ottomans and others were involved in? I mean, the simple answer is yes. But it then it now comes down to people's today's sensitivities of whether they think that's sufficient mm. or whether they're satisfied with with any form of slavery. Mm. And then that goes to the question of the slavery in Islam in itself. Mm. Um, but it wasn't. I mean, they still applied the law. For example, of that um, slaves had to be had to be fed and clothed in the same way as their master. F- slaves who became Muslim had the right to be free. Um, being part of the Janissary Corps was once again a privilege mm. because you had certain um, agency to access to resources and so forth. Um, slaves, like I said, became part of the, the palace domains themselves, and people became sultans from slaves and grand viziers from slaves. So, in that sense, the it, it, it's how do you define the word slave The definition becomes important here And I think there is a debate that needs to be had on that itself mm. I think the comparison between the Ottoman uh, The Ottoman mannerism m- Manner of doing slavery And the transatlantic slavery are still very different I, mean, I would say it's well to part Yeah, it, it, it is um, And um, while I am sensitive towards this whole idea of slavery But I, I, I think the Ottomans from what I see Are still very different An unfair comparison? Yeah, I think I think it is an unfair comparison, personally, just because um, different time, different ways. I mean, colonial powers were savage in the way that they were doing things. Mm. Um, whereas, well, they were wiping out entire peoples in yeah, North I mean, America, in South America, in Australia. Yeah. So, and and then kind of literally shipping mil- hundreds and thousands of free people from Africa, then forcing yeah. them to accept Christianity. Yeah. They're not even al- even after accepting Christianity, not even allowing them to be in the same churches as them. Yeah. So, I don't think. The Ottomans or any Muslim dynasty or entity or polity ever did that. Look, I mean, they, in every form of slavery, there's going to be an element of coercion, I guess, and manipulation yeah. that we, we can lay a charge at them. Mm. But that level of violence wasn't there. Mm. There wasn't an attempt to to do. I mean, th- that level of abuse wasn't there. Mm. Um, but there is a hierarchy for sure within the yeah. society. Mm. And what I'm saying is that um, even within that, that system and that hierarchy, there were opportunities to make it to the top, okay. which is quite interesting. Which was never then the transatlantic slave trade, really. I've never seen it. Yeah. I, um, so, um, but in the case of the Ottomans, like I said, I mean, you could become Grand Vizier. That, that in itself is something that needs to be examined. Um, During the Ottoman state, uh, mm. f- throughout the kind of 600 year span, um, were there pubs in the state? Public drinking houses? Uh, Beyond the quarters of the Christians and the Jews? Oh no, I mean, some non-Muslim areas had drinking areas Of course, that, um, and there's a charity basis for that, uh, yeah. that, that they are Now, whether, whether Muslims are frequenting in those places is possible okay. yeah. But Muslims couldn't get licenses for it Okay, but from your reading, there's never been a case where there were like 
equivalent of pubs in Muslim areas within the state? Not that I know of. I mean, if it's happened, I'd like to see the information for that. But I mean, if the question is being asked to me of whether Muslims are doing things of that nature, it's very possible. But this, there, there are mechanisms of the state taxing things like alcohol and sale of alcohol and so forth. Mm. But it, it would have been exceptional, I guess, to, to assume that a Muslim could have got a license to sell alcohol. Okay. Um, there's another claim uh, made by uh, Muslims who specialize in other yeah. uh, areas of Islamic history, and that is whilst, yes, the Ottomans had a glorious longevity to their rule and their existence mm. and their state building. Um, unlike the Umayyads, unlike the Abbasids, unlike the Khulafa Rashidin, unlike mm. the Mughals, unlike um, you know, let's say even even the Mamluks to some mm. degree, um, they never really produced quality and celebrated scholarship. Um, I think that's unfair. I think it goes back to my point before about is is it that they're not producing good scholarship or is it that we don't have the ability to access that scholarship? We don't really know who 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 from who from the six hundred years of Ottoman history do we celebrate as scholars today that where we we where we where we learn about them in fiqh we learn about them in theology we learn about them. that's one towards the latter Zahid al three Z- uh, Ibn Abidin okay the list can go on um, Sayyid Nursi Muhammad Akif Hamdi Yazar Musa Kazim the list can go on people read them but it's just that people are not accessing them because that that's something that they need to get access of. I mean, some of the most seminary scholars, even now, there's a book written by Samuel Yub, who's a scholar. It talks about ulama in Egypt that were very influential in the 18th century in regards to uh, Hanafi fiqh and so forth. It doesn't end. Would you say then, so when I've, when I've been faced with that question, yeah. I've countered it by saying, look guys, yeah, no disrespect to the giants who, uh, of our ulama who lived throughout the times in the past, but maybe have you ever wondered that during the Ottoman period, the ulama of that time didn't actually have time to re- write books as much as others in other regions, but they were literally part of the state itself. Yes, they were part of the state, but they also did produce. It's just like I said, my charge is, and I'll make the same charge openly here, which is Muslims don't know anything about 600 years of Ottoman history. Forget ulama, they don't know anything. Is that the fault of the ulama? Or is oh, that the fault of us who, who don't access any of the information? Okay. So this is part of the problem here. I think we need to take responsibility that look, when the Ottomans collapsed to some degree, and I, I make this case very clear, the Ottomans were not colonizers and they weren't colonized. They were abolished. And when that happens, that colonial interaction that takes place within the Ottoman world is quite seismic where we become disconnected from information. Now, there is old scholarship that survives, and that's because, by and large, those societies at the time had no problem with pre-Ottoman scholarship's existence. But Ottoman scholarship existence is problematic because it can revive a particular mindset that is still very current. And, right? it, can, and, and, and it can reconnect a people who are seeking some kind of resurgence yeah, revival. So I said this about my mosques. When you see Ottoman mosques today, right? Turkish mosques that are built... You in asked me this. Yeah. So when I'm visiting you in Istanbul, yeah. I assumed incorrectly that Hagia Sophia was the Ottoman architectural mosque. Right. You said that wasn't. No. You said we took that from the Greeks, from the Byzantines. So, so, fa- yeah, so that's the Byz- Byzantines, and Fatih's mosque was built by a Greek. Then you went and took me in these other corners, yeah. do you remember, the, the Hamidian mosque, that's right. remember? That's right. And they looked completely different. They looked completely different. The styles were Andalusian, the styles were, you know... Uh, it's amazing because the imagination of the Ottoman mosque still, even now today, is 16th century. Why? Why people don't see the nineteenth century mosques? So, you know, why? Because that imagination is taken away from you. So the only imagination we have is we have to go all the way back in time that's irrelevant to us. Mm. And the imagine of the imagination of something which is very close to us, mm. we don't want to know. Uh, forget that. Ask young people today. Nine eleven. Have no imag- No recollection of nine eleven. Um, ask them about you know um, American invasion of Iraq first time. Gulf War. Mm. Um, ask them about the creation of the state of Israel. Mm. Ask them about World War One, World War Two. The memories don't even go that far back because everything is now. Yeah. And yet, I think we were suffering from that to some degree. Where this whole corpus of work, mm. um, the access to this, is, it's hard. I mean, like imagine you need to learn Arabic, you need to learn Ottoman Turkish, you need to learn other um, Islamic languages. You you maybe need to learn French, German, Armenian, Greek. Then there's access to Baghdad, access to Istanbul, access to Konya, access to Damascus. 
Damascus or as to the Kosovo, like who's going to put in the effort? Mm. Who's going to put in the effort to do that? So I'll give an example. When I have friends who are Arabs, who when they write about Mustafa Sabri Effendi, they write about it from the perspective of what he wrote in Arabic. But he wrote in Ottoman Turkish too. And there's a large corpus of works in which he was a journalist. He wrote in many newspapers. So they can't access that. And that access is important because if they want to make sense of his last piece of work, which is called Marko Falakal, mm. you can see the process, his brain process. First he was writing Ottoman Turkish, then goes to Egypt and writes in Arabic. Would you say someone like Yusuf al Nabhani was, was a celebrated figure? Yeah, Mark Yusuf al Nabhani was very close to Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And he writes a lot of works, poems, and, and whatnot. He's not the only one, that's what I mean. Like, all of these people put them in their place at the time and then put the pieces together. Um, a lot of them did a lot of good works. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so just before we kind of bring the podcast to a close, you are still strongly maintaining oh. that the Ottoman uh, dynasty, the state, mm. the the dawla was Islamic. Yeah, like I said, I I think the charge needs to make, be made about what makes it un-Islamic, and I think this is the problem. Like Muslims, if Muslims are doing this of trying to like knock the building down, I think they need to be a little bit careful. I find a problem, and and it's something which I've. I'm, I'm, I've come to terms with now um, Not referring to the Ottomans as an empire yeah. Because an empire has a very distinct definition In yeah. how it manifests its power mm-hmm. When it goes to it, when it spreads So wow. for example <clears throat> If you look at the British Empire The French Empire The Spanish Empire you You find that it has a very violent uh, and then a very, a very oppressive manifestation of how it consumes people mm-hmm. and how it implements its ideology, its mm-hmm. faith, whatever. And I don't think that's a fair usage of the language to describe not just the Ottomans, but but generally any kind of. Like I, I, I wouldn't really refer to the Mughals as an empire, because they mm-hmm. did not force, they did not, they not, they didn't yeah. necessarily colonize. The, the Hindu masses The Abbasids do not necessarily colonize And enforce their idea, their deen mm. upon the people And I don't think it's fair To even refer to the Ottomans as an empire do, it, do you find it a problem to refer to the Ottomans as an empire? It's interesting It comes down to how like so I've had these conversations with colleagues of mine before about. So one of the things I've tried to do Is exercise how we use language mm. Especially in the English medium And how English as a language How helpful is it to explain like Ottoman experiences. So, for example, I'm, I find it problematic to use the word pan-Islamism. I don't like it, and because that's, because, that's because Islamism is a problem. Exa- Islamism comes from pan-Islamism, yeah, right? Yeah. And the idea, as that, is political Islam, we were right, talking about this. exactly. So to make this charge that there is a political Islam, then there's an Islam. Yes. All right. Now, what did what did the words that the Muslims used at the what time? They used the term ittihad Islam. They had a, 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 a. Now, someone will say that we're just translating that, but mm. translations are loaded. Mm. Um, and so now, does pan-Islamism reflect Ittihad al-Islam? And I just don't think it does. It could be the same phenomenon, but the gaze is different, right? So, how can I explain it? Like, I've said this before, like dawah. We say we do dawah. Oh, okay, fine. And now, if you call that Muslim missionary activity, a lot of Muslims will be irked by that. They'll say, wait, wait, hang on a minute. That doesn't quite, that's not fitting in what we... Now, that's how it might be perceived from that perspective. Yeah. And it might be the same phenomenon. But how you look at something with your own agency in terms of the words you use, yeah. in terms of how you feel about what you're doing, and how external words are used to explain your agency, it's an issue here. Mm. So now the issue of going back to empire is how comfortable are Muslims using the word? A lot of academics are trying to... I'm not comfortable using it. Right. And a lot of academics are trying to strip this power dynamics away from the word empire by saying, you know, the Romans were an empire, the Byzantines were an empire, so we're placing the Ottomans within this context. Some academics have tried to exercise the idea of using the word Ottoman domains, Ottoman, uh, you know, and, and, and whatnot. I've exercised that and tried that. I'm talking about internally as Muslims. Like, like, like I think, think there's a lot of 19th century baggage. So when yeah. we think of empire, we think of the British and the French. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with it. And, um, and we think of the Romans I and mean, the Byzantines. But generally, when we think of empire, it's colonialism. It's colonialism. Yeah. And those of us who live in the United Kingdom, yeah, yeah, it's we British, understand, like British even empire. today, yeah. um, you know, we were talking, they were talking on television the other day about OBs and so yeah. removing the word empire. Yeah. And people got really triggered in this country. Yeah, of course it's intriguing would. because they, they are attached to the notion that they were this great empire. Mm. And so empire has this connotation. Now, if you look at that in mind, then when you call the Ottomans an empire, from that perspective, I can see why Muslims would be agitated by it. Mm. So this is where the question... The Ottomans didn't call themselves technically an empire. Did they, the, did, you know the Ottoman Khulafa, I'm not going to say this, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say those that came before, the eight that came before Salim, yeah. yeah. but those that came after Salim, who were Khulafa, yeah. did they see themselves as Turkic rulers or rulers of the Muslims? 
Did they see themselves as Islamic rulers? And they use multiple titles, man. I mean, like you know, when you look at Islam, Kaisari Rum, Shah, yeah, exactly, all of that. Um, Why? Yeah. Because th- for them, they saw Islam as a civilizational worldview about life. Mm. They they saw themselves as like you know, Islam is like for everything now. And so yes, I'm I am a caliph and I am your emperor and I am your you know whatever. I'm all of these things, yeah, because I'm in charge now. Mm. And so would they have exercised that type of language? Yes, of mm. course. Does that mean that? Um, but did they see themselves as Muslim rulers as yeah, opposed to as opposed to Turkic rulers? No, of course they saw themselves. As, I mean, why would they then? Why would they be obsessed with using this word caliphate? There's no need for it. Mm. Yeah, but why? What are they? What are they trying to attach themselves to? They're trying to attach themselves to a particular institutionalized political discourse of Sunni Islam, and they want to be a part of that. Right, so they want to be a part of the Umayyads. They want to be a part of the Abbasids. They want to be part of the legacy of the Khulafa Rashidun. Really fascinating. World War One. So when Makkah and Medina was being lost, by and large, right, the Hijaz, shall I say, the Ottomans, yes, were traumatized. But when they lost Baghdad, it was a huge shock to their system. It was a huge, and in their work, you can see we lost the center of the Abbasid Caliphate. Mm. That's what they write in because they still held it very close to their heart. Because it was the gateway to the Arab world. Yeah. Right. Mm. So what you see here is is um, and a lot of these imaginations in their mind. I mean, so they believed that. No Khilaf or no Islam Is that how they understood it? Well they understood Islam as a comprehensive worldview about life And that that comprehensive worldview about life cannot be implemented once the state is gone Then they're no different to their dynastic predecessors then Yeah could, of could, course, many before them So, But that is the default understanding of the institution of Khilaf within our tradition That's how the Ottomans uh, With exception yeah. of the last 80 to 100 years with, with all other external pressures and attempts to redefine and etc cetera, etc cetera. But that's generally yeah. the And I'm saying this not from the perspective of the Sultans I'm, I'm saying this from the perspective of the ulama themselves there's a wonderful book written by Mona Hassan, she's a scholar And she talks about this collapse of the Abbasids and the collapse of the Ottomans And trauma that the Ulama feel on both sides And she does a comparative study And you can see the, the trauma is the same And how even then the Ulama are like, going, oh wait a minute, what's going on? Okay. When you say collapse of the Abbasids, are you talking about 1258 or 1517? No, the, not 1517 1258, yeah, that's right okay. And she, it's this comparative study which is intriguing like, mm. So what happens is like Many ulama are now writing So mm. for example Mustafa Sabri friend is really unique I, I know I keep going to him So he has this idea in 1908 Of trying to institutionalize a constitutional caliphate That's his obsession mm. Then when World War I happens His obsession is now caliphate alone Lose the institution Muslims are going to be left on their own Caliphate collapses Then his obsession is Aqidah I mean, safeguard Aqidah We don't mm. safeguard that We're finished. We're finished So you yeah. can see his list of priorities And how mm. he operates That's his work um, it's very difficult for me to then make a loaded uh, judgment on how he was thinking And he wasn't the only one thinking that way mm. So the point I'm making is he was a, he was a Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman domains mm. So he's reflective of a particular mindset So for the Ottomans, what I'm saying is we can One could critique saying this is Islamic, this is not Islamic That's irrelevant for me What's relevant for me is how they felt mm. right? And they felt Islamic mm. And they felt Islamic from their purview of the culture that they were Exercising, which was Islam. Yeah. Now it's really nice now having a crystal ball and going back in time and saying you're not good enough. And I think that's unfair. I, f- I think sometimes when we talk about this and we critique previous, look, what charge will history put on us today? Exactly. I always say this. Yeah. When they look back at us. Yeah. What charge will we put on us? us right. Yeah, so, yeah. so we have to be a little careful. I said to you before that I'm uncomfortable when I write about Muslims of the past. Yeah. I always say, and Allah knows best, because I don't want those Muslims of the past to say, you know what, this guy lied about me or made charges against me, which not true, and he published it. And people read it That for me makes me very nervous It makes me very nervous So um, I, we're so flippant in the way that we talk about human beings mm. Especially human beings are dead mm. Because we assume because they're dead it's, we can just do that No, we have far more of a responsibility Of now safeguarding the integrity of those individuals Because they are dead so And they can't defend themselves Right? Um, how significant was the abdication of Mutawakkil the third, the last Abbasid Khalif, the defeat of the Mamluks in Marj Dabik, yeah. and then Salim Yawaz Rahimahullah announcing himself as Khalifa. How significant was that event? Or was it not as significant as it's purported in, 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 in the way we read it, perhaps? Was it was it a big thing for the Ottomans? It is difficult to know. I mean it could be that Salim just went, Yeah, fine, whatever. Just he's so confident he just walked down and said, no, it's just I'm done. Or it could be the fact that Salim's thinking, you know what, I finally made it. It's difficult to know. A lot of the ideas we have at that period are explanations of the past. Yeah. 
So whether they were celebrating that we've become caliphs or not, I don't think that happened. Let's say, but was it a big thing for the House of Osman? I think. I think it is a seismic shift in what the House of Osman has become. Yeah. I think the the, the seminary moments are um, Orhan Ghazi, so yeah. not Osman, but Orhan, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, because Orhan is the one who actually names the dynasty after his father, right? Oh. Then I think Bayezid's time Because what Bayezid is He institutionalized an idea of Devlet itself yep. Bayezid is obsessed with the notion of Devlet yep. And then Fatih's conquer of Istanbul For sure, you can't deny that Fatih's conquer of Istanbul Changed the game totally um, The fulfillment of a prophecy n- Fulfillment of a prophecy and, 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 the te- and the entrance to Europe Exactly, and not only that I mean the, the access to a centre of power yeah. right? And it's an Ottoman centre of power yeah. So Mecca, Medina, Baghdad Damascus, Cairo, they prior Ottomans. This is Ottoman now. Yeah. This is a, we we did. This. It's a new thing, right? And then after that, you'd have to say Selim's conquest in terms of centralizing. So Orhan, Orhan naming the dynasty after his father Osman, yeah. Bayezid, who was fixated with the creation of of a state, mm. um, the conquest and the fulfillment of the prophecy of the taking of Constantinople. Yeah. And then you would put 1517 up there. Yeah, I think in, in that sense, when you see that progression of that period of time, in that sense, Selim's. Selim's efforts of trying to centralize the Arab provinces to Anatolia, uh, Istanbul and the, the Balkans in that sense is seismic because it changes everything. Mm. It now becomes a produ- the Muslim influx is large. Mm. The Muslim production of knowledge from Arabic now in, impacts. So, you know, prior to this, so Hussein Yilmaz's book you spoke about, yeah. one of the most interesting he to- things he talks about is Ottoman Turkish itself. Yeah. Ottoman Turkish prior to Selim and then Suleiman was... The ulama were uncomfortable using this language. They yeah. were still using Arabic and Farsi yeah. as the language of intelligentsia. They weren't confident in making that fusion, were they? Right. Now that Istanbul becomes a center and Selim has now centralized everything, yeah. Ottoman as a language starts to feed off Arabic. Mm. And there's far more interaction. And they have these policies of bringing works from Egypt and so forth, bringing them to Istanbul on this axis. So um, even if we make the charge that it's not a caliphate, okay, or that it was important, not important, but the fact that they managed to do that Changed the dynamic of what it meant to be the Ottoman Sultanate, mm. for sure. That that, and then Suleiman after that, mm. Baghdad, and so and, and just expands out. So in that sense, you have to say that that is a seismic moment. Um, you know, in terms of the land span, mm. uh, which I I believe hit its pinnacle under Suleiman, mm. rahimahullah. Um, mm. Was there ever an objection mm. to the legitimacy of the claim to Khilafah, because they were the first? Dynasty who are non-Arabs to have made that mm. claim. So you're talking about the Qurayshi hadith. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of the Hanafis yeah. uh, within, within the, the, the Muhammad position within the Hanafis yeah. is that a non-Qurayshi can be a Khalifa. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's fine. So, so, yeah. so amongst the Turks and the Ottomans, that's mm. fine. Did you ever find in your reading that mm. non-Turks objected to to their claim to Khilafah? I couldn't find anything. If See, they if they did, I just don't think the Ottomans cared. <laughs> so no, but it, it you know. I mean, imagine, imagine the cards they're holding in their hand. Yeah. Like, okay, let's just say, let's just talk India, for example. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what they think now. Yeah. You know, I've got Makkah, Medina, Damascus, Cairo, Istanbul, Balkans. Look at what I'm holding. You know, one of the charts, Timurlane, for example, when Timurlane goes to war with Bayezid. Yeah. So Bayezid actually says he's part of the Kaya tribe. He doesn't say he's part of the Ottomans in that yeah. sense, right? And Timurlane says, I'm a... Um, my ancestry is Genghis Khan. Yeah. Do you know who you're dealing with? Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. That matters in that yeah. sense. So now, if you're going to put the charge to the Ottomans that you're not okay with, it doesn't matter. What am I holding? Mm. N- not only Najaf, Karbala, J- Jerusalem. Look, look at what I'm holding. So whether they fought like that or not, but they would have thought, I guess, that I've got all these cards and yes, I am the caliph. But, and, and at the same time, with, um, I'm put, putting aside Osman Fodi and the Sokoto, mm. no one else really claimed it whilst they did. You know what's important? I think this is what's lacking in, in studies regarding uh, the, um, the Ottoman Caliphate. It's one, what are the conditions of a Caliphate? Absolutely. And two, what are the conditions of a Khalifa? Absolutely. I think Muslims need to look at that and then see whether the Ottomans fulfilled that. And by and large, you can they see... They did. It. Yeah, exactly. They did. Because you know what we're doing is we're taking credit away from the ulama. Yeah. We're assuming that the ulama have colluded in some shape they or did. form. But let's look at the work. The ulama throughout history, what I've noticed is in their ijma, there's always been people that would critique something that was yeah, yeah, was yeah. claimed, right? No, the bait was fulfilled. Yeah. And, and, and and in terms of the responsibilities of the state and the khalifa were generally fulfilled. Yeah. I mean, even in the 19th century, when certain ulama critiqued Abdul Hamid, mm. it's intriguing. They didn't say that they critiqued the house of Osman as being a caliphate. They, mm. The charge they made was Abdul Hamid wasn't fit enough to be caliph. 
Interesting. You understand? And Interesting. this was the movement that was happening in, the, in, in mm. that sense. Um, you recently wrote uh, a, a, a fairly long piece uh, mm. for the Yaqeen Institute, mm-hmm. uh, uh, reconnecting. It'll be, it'll be on the screen. Um, re, you know, urging the Muslims to kind of reconnect with Ottoman history and yeah. trying to understand it, and that there's a sense of a, a kind of collective amnesia. Yeah. Um, elaborate a bit. I, I, Mm. I'm not asking you to recap the entire piece, but 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 what what's the because you you already use that term collective amnesia. Yeah. So where does understanding Ottoman history fit, especially the challenges faced by Khalifa Abdul Hamid rahimahullah, mm. World War One and those challenges of the Young Turks, mm. um, nationalism, Arab nationalism, mm. separatism in the Balkans, internal, external. Mm. Um, where does all of that fit in with the state of the Ummah today? Well, wow. okay, uh, so in terms of the Yakin Institute article, I look like, like I said, I'm really appreciative they gave me a platform to write, and then they allowed what I wrote in the way I wrote to, to go out there. Um, now, I, yes, I was insistent on this idea of collective amnesia, and you know, I've spoken to psychologists before, I have a friend who's a Muslim and he's a psychologist, and mm. like one of the questions he asks is, how can you have collective amnesia? How does that happen? Right? How does collective amnesia happen? But the idea is, is that there was an idea which was prevalent in a particular group of people at one moment of time, and now that idea is no longer prevalent. It, it disappeared, 100%. right? And so what's happened is there is a, a moment in, in Islamic history globally where Istanbul is the center, where the Ottomans are a power, where people are aware of the name of Osman and the Ottomans and Abdul Hamid II and so forth. And now, like 100 years later, as I said to you before, somebody said to me that, does Sultan Abdul Hamid come after um, Salah al-Din Ayyub? How did that happen? What's going on here? I mean, you have to say that the collapse of uh, the Ottomans, the formation of the nation state, the ideologies that come about during the nation states, uh, programs, various programs in the various provinces, colonization, the idea of empire, the superiority of the West in terms of this intellectual production, all has created um, multiple like divots in the mind of Muslims to the point that that no longer becomes important. Muslims, I, like I said before, are only interested in the day to day. That's not their fault. That's what's happened. And history and the learning of the past has become seen as a privilege. I felt the same, right? So when I would mention something like the Ottomans, why should anyone care? Which is the question. Why should I care? But it should matter because actually that. It's about identity. Your identity is being shaped for you. You are being told who you are and who you ought to be and who you were. That's problematic. That's majorly problematic. Right. Okay. Because we have no agency to define who we are, where we're going, and what we were. Right. And, and Islam has clear instructions as to how we navigate with these issues. Yeah, exactly. So now, look, some of the things we talked about, about some of the problems with the Ottomans, I don't mind people calling me on that. There are some mistakes I'm sure I've made in that sense because my expertise is in the 19th, 20th century. They weren't Muslim, they weren't Ambiya. Yeah, Khalas. that's right. <laughs> But here, in now in our process, our focus in terms of people who have the, the ability to, to access information, knowledge and so forth, we are still quite ill-informed. And that, that is a problem for me. We don't even know what's happening in our localities at times. Now that's a challenge for me. So how do we make this period important for people? Well, it's important because it shows that from the 19th century onwards, how the colonization of the Muslim mind took place. That for me is because once the Ottomans collapse, the Ottomans are a form of resistance towards a particular hegemonic worldview about life. Would you say they were the last standing of Islamic civilization? Yeah, of course they are. Of course they are. I mean, like I said, they they were not colonizers, nor were they colonized, and you had to you had to break that with a sledgehammer, so that you know nation states are created, resources, people, human beings are becoming resources again, so forth. Right. So here now, gradually, over time, um, this like indoctrination process takes place in the Muslim mindset where this is not important, this is irrelevant, who cares about this, let's just keep going forward. That for me is is troublesome and there's a lot you can see in that period that you start to see how the the project of the colonization of the Muslim mind takes place. I think that's something we need to pay attention to. So that collective amnesia concerns me Mm. and then like I said so we can't even go back in time to the time of Rasul Sallam, right? And we're talking about Muslim scholarship, 600 years is gone. Mm. And you and I are now speculating about many things about what happened in the Ottoman period. And we're having this conversation. This should be common knowledge in Muslim societies. Mm. This is our history for crying out loud. Absolutely. You know, you, like why don't we know this? And, and why, why are we saying this is Turkish history? 
Well, this is history of the Turks. Well, that's something that's been fed to. That's, yeah, that's been fed to of us. Of course, you're Muslim. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, like, why should you not be invested in what people did in the past? Mm. And we shouldn't be uh, apologetic about the way that we present our history. I mean, you made some valid points about points of criticism. I mm. think we should, we should interact with those points of criticism and see what mistakes were made mm. and if they were mistakes and if they're nuanced and how we can learn from it. How do we even begin? One of the challenges I face when I visit Islamic societies in the UK and MSAs in Canada and elsewhere one of the challenges I fa face is uh, a question that keeps reoccurring I, And that is how do we even begin to take ownership of our narrative mm -hmm. And I guess a cliched response would be To reframe the epistemology or the, the moral basis of our, of our tradition or the conversation, right? So how would one even begin to make sense of the Ottoman history Without understanding the realities uh, and the destructive nature of European colonialism, the mm. birth of the secular nation state, etc., etc. How can the Ummah, Muslims, whether they be ulama, mm. activists, academics, doctors, taxi drivers, wherever they may be, mm. how do we even begin to start kind of warming up that engine to think of an alternative? And an alternative which existed for far longer than these nation states. Yeah, it's, it's simple. It's la ilaha. I used to ask my students all the time, what is your shahada? What does it mean? In the time of Rasul they, they understood that the statement that Rasul is bringing is quite a radical idea and it's, it's an intellectual one as well, right? Mm. Because look, Ashadu Allah ilaha it's a rational disposition for you making this. Mm. That's important for Muslims to be in. I, I ask Muslims, what is Islam? It sounds like a bizarre question. Ask them. I, uh, some will say it means peace, some exactly. will say okay. submission, some will say, yeah, yeah is it so, you? so, even this basic of what is Islam, yeah. why, why is the Quran central, why is the Quran, um, for example, miracle of Kalam Allah, so for all of these things, the foundations have to be tight. Mm. And once you can place yourself in the world that you live in, mm. so the reason why this is important is because for us as Muslims, the first question, La ilaha, comes from a position of certainty. La, it's no, right? Yep. And then from that position of certainty, you then have a certainty of who you are. Yep. You have a certainty in relation to Allah Ta'ala, Quran, Islam, and so forth. And then you have a level of confidence of what you're about. Mm. But if you come from a position of uncertainty, mm. then you start doubting everything. And then that's part of the problem. Mm. So first there has to be this... Agency, what we're talking about first, has to come from that perspective first. Then once you gain that agency, then how do you place yourself in regards to what Muslims did in the past and how you feel about that? And then we can make sense of Muslims made mistakes, this, that, the other, but what is Islam? What's mm. happening with Islam? That's mm. the most important thing. You now we are human beings, we are flawed, we're going to make mistakes. Muslims made mistakes in the past. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think Muslims are being just pulverized intellectually and psychologically to the point that there's an embarrassment it sounds harsh and I feel this There's an embarrassment of saying you're Muslim Okay And if you say it Then you have to say it within a particular context You're being told what type of Muslim you ought to be Yeah Right And what kind of Muslim is acceptable in today's right. times And then you're told what type of Muslims were good Muslims in the past Yeah So then you have that issue Heck we're even told externally what is our golden era and what isn't Yeah exactly We don't even get to choose what right. our golden era exactly. is Exactly And when we do do it It's either from a point of defence mm. We're apologising or nostalgia yeah. This is not helpful for the young Muslim mind Because human beings are flawed They want reality But we need a bit of nostalgia isn't it? A bit of nostalgia is healthy yeah, I mean, look, yeah. It's not a problem for me in that sense You know, People watch Arturul so we I get bit, it We need a bit of Arturul Yeah, yeah, I get yeah, it you know? Osman and that. We need yeah, a bit of that in our life I, No, I get it But you know on your everyday day-to-day -day activity no, you, you need, need to, reality Right, and when Muslims <laughs> have access to information When yeah. they have access to resources yeah. And they have access to read And they have access to YouTube and whatnot mm. The problem they have is that, like I said, they become traumatized by the Islamic past mm. because they have a particular framework and they're judging it from that framework. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I do believe that we need more people in the communities who are investing in these fields. Uh, I understand we need to make money, we need to work and so forth. And education in the Western context is driven towards attaining a job. It's monetized. In Islam, it wasn't. Islam education was designed to create a person who was a good person in society. Mm. It was pleasing the Lord, the maker. My last question to you for today's podcast, um, away from the various revivalist movements that came after the abolishment of the Khilafah, mm -hmm. um, and the many kind of, not just movements, the scholars and others, um, mm. putting all of that aside, mm. do you feel that the destructive nature of European colonialism, the brutality and the outcome it has taken place, the Sykes-Pukon, all mm. of that, in the within the um, Middle East and North Africa, 
is coupled with now this concerted effort to downplay, remove, omit, and even redefine the centrality of a caliphate as an Islamic institution for Muslim political unity. I think that debate we've already gone past that debate. I, I think that's uh, no, no, no. But if you've got people still asking you, Ustad, yeah, that is caliphate an obligation in Islam or is caliphate something that's Islamic? Then we do need to carry on with these reminders. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not only that. I mean, people are asking me for fundamental questions like you know, Akida. Mm. So Sabri was right. If you look at Sabri, he's he's quite right in that context. Um, look, I, if Muslims turn to their tradition, if they just invest in that, not you know, I. I People say stuff like The ulama said Alright, which ulama? Give me some names I'm an academic So mm. this is what I do now mm. The ulama have categorically agreed on something mm. Which ulama? <laughs> Who are you talking about? So that I can look them up That old, that old chestnut Yeah, because it's thrown out As, as, a, as a way of mm. making the assumption And it's an assumption Yeah, yeah And so we buy into that narrative Ourselves The mm. self-fulfilling assumption But who? So that I can look at these people And see what they actually said So that we can put this culture forward I mean Muslims to a certain degree are afraid or detached from their tradition to such a degree that when they see words that have been demonized in the West, they become nervous or ignorant. And don't, don't even want to touch it with a brush. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not just that. There's many words in, in, in the Islamic tradition. which be, So it's weird how translation... Khilafah, Sharia, Jihad, Hudud. Right. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. interesting, right? How translation works. Yeah. So there's some words that are translated and then some words that are left dirty and messy. Yeah. We're not going to translate those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to sound foreign. Jihad, Sharia is kept the way it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas uh, apostasy... apostasy right. Uh, and, and this was, yeah, so some are kept the way it is because it sounds scary and foreign. Right. And others are translated incorrectly or yeah, unfairly. I'm saying, look, just give the young kids the access to that information mm. so and in, in a controlled environment where there are scholars and ulama who can help them with that mm. it wouldn't surprise me we're going to get to a point where they're just going to say islam is the problem you know and that's it you know and and this is what scares me a little bit yeah. um so there was this whole idea of trying to make sense of political islam islam this, that. now it's just yet yeah, it's islam it's the problem concluding advice concluding advice to two groups of people yeah uh, if you can kindly keep it Brief but succinct Which I know you will yeah. Advice to our faith leaders and ulama yeah. With regards to reconnecting with Islamic history And to Muslims reconnect Because you have to Because you can't I, I guess when you're advising ulama It's different when you're advising the awam yeah. What would your advice be to those two groups of people With regards to the importance of Not just Ottoman history But Islamic history in terms of revival and yeah. way, You know I feel from. uncomfortable advising the ulama These are people I look up to But I think if I was to just make a general But they're point, not free of advice No start. they're not They're not free of advice yeah, None of us are free But it's still yeah. I was raised in a culture Where it's a little Look I think we all have to um, Sit down and talk mm. And let's sit down We're on the same side And let's try to find The multiple forms of information And knowledge that we can put down mm. um, For the future of This generation And the next generation And mm. we need to do that and we need to have these conversations. And even if these conversations make us blue in the face and we're not happy and we don't like what somebody's saying, mm. let's sit down and try to come to some sort of um, agreement of what it is we need to do to go forward in terms of creating knowledge. My concern has always been, I guess, in England, and I notice this because I don't live here anymore, is that there's an obsession in the West, and I understand why, of Muslim identity, of safeguarding Muslim identity. On the same token, I would like there to be an emphasis on, on product, scholarship, production of knowledge. Because that's equally important. If you don't pr produce knowledge in itself, if you're not a people who, who are not driving to produce knowledge. But we have Azhar, we have Darul Uloom, we have Medina, we have these, these, um, these seminaries that are producing ulama like robots. No, but I, I, I believe everywhere. Mm. I, I think that needs to be done everywhere. So, like, I'm from England, right? Mm. And then I moved to Turkey. And we create these human connectivities and mm. these different knowledge bases. We bring them together to see how we can make it work. Mm. Um, at the moment, I don't think we're having these conversations. Look, I think it's okay to say we don't know what's going on at the moment. I don't have a problem with that. If Muslims said, you know what, because like, often we're driven down the direction we should have the answers. I think it's okay to say we don't know what the answers are. That's a starting point. Then let's talk about it. How do we go forward? And um, I think we should be dictating less mm. and conversing more. And we don't listen. We just don't. We don't listen to each other. We're not listening to the young people, do you, for what they're asking, what they want. 
I said to you this before, they want new faces, they want fresh faces, they want different voices, they want to be part of that discussion, they want to be visible too. Mm. Uh, so when you see the case of Rasulullah and Osama and Imam Ali, mm. both of them, Rasulullah turned to them for advice, mm. he wasn't alien to that. Mm. And we somehow seem to assume that kids are kids. Mm. If they're acting like kids, then let's make them act like adults. Yeah. Let's make them inclusive, include them in and so forth. And then we have elders in our society, which we ignore as being idiots. Mm. That's really unfair because they have a lot of wisdom. I told you before that my parents learned Islam from osmosis. They taught me manners. They taught me how to be a good person. I had to talk to my neighbor and so forth. That was so valuable for me. So we shouldn't be so arrogant in this generation assuming because I'm a PhD graduate that somehow I'm better than these people. It's not. So let's listen to the communities and not just the local communities. Extend it out and let's create these networks. Let's travel. Let's have this access and let's have these conversations. But I think... It's time to do something different More connection, more conversations I hope so <clears throat> And this is why, look, once again you brought me on here I don't know how important Like, I don't know how this is going to be like, It sounds very important to me yeah. he, 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 he thinks he is and he is to me You know, and um, I, I don't know how important my voice is I, I, Look, I'm, I'm a bit of a weirdo, I understand that But, you know But I care um, I, I'm emotional as a person, no doubt I care about Islam, I care about this Ummah and I fear Allah Ta'ala And I think that's important And we, at least if we can give the Muslims that uh, And then trust them a little bit So um, People like me People like you people, All of us in this room We need to step up Inshallah. You know what I mean May Allah bless you Thank you May Allah bless your work Can I just say thanks a lot for having me No, 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 no. I really mean that no, well, like The, the um, honour was truly mine. No, um, and uh, look I hope um, I hope I haven't offended any of your viewers No, 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 like no, no. And, I, mm. and, and just a message I, I did not mean any offence to our celebrated ulama and tulab al-ilm From the seminaries that I mentioned mm. But there is a reality that look That, you know, from the graduates and scholars I've hailed from these uh, institutions themselves That, you know, we've got to a stage where it's not a problem of The quantity of ulama mm. that we produce But there is definitely a massive discussion about the quality In terms of actually changing our state as an ummah um, Every guest that comes onto the podcast. Um, oh yeah, so I saw this. Yeah, but no, no, no. But you're special okay. because uh, scholars and teachers yeah, yeah. don't get the offer of arm wrestle. Because oh, okay. I, I don't offend my elders like this. Have you won a fumble yet? Huh? Have you won a fumble? You know that I've not won a single fumble. So would you like to do that? Because then you can win. Because I'm not good at that. But no, you you've said that, so that makes me think that you're. But probably I will try. Gonna... Bismillah. Yeah. Okay. So it's one, uh, one two, three, four. four I three, declare three, four, a thumb four, war. And then how, oh, oh, wow, you got a long thumb there. Like, oh, wait, 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 wait. One, two, three. That's my first thumb war victory, Zui. Bang, bang, bang. Okay. Oh, I'll do that. That was my first time more victory oh, Where is it? So there you go Zakhallah oh, like, khair It was an honestly great honour having no, you on Thank you very much for having me Thank um, you I hope that when you do come to the UK That more universities, more masajid More Islamic institutions get in touch with you uh, Because you truly are an asset But okay. I'm not going to throw no more sand or dirt on your face anymore um, And I just wanted to know that I love you and your work And your counsel to me I appreciate that, thank you very much uh, And on that note, brothers and sisters uh, I bring today's podcast to a close Please check out our partners at the bottom of this screen uh, Familybreaks.org.uk um, subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel Leave a comment on the video don't, It doesn't have to be a positive comment Please tell those that His voice is actually pretty sick um, uh, Share the video Subscribe to the Five Pillars channel For our views from North America Subscribe to the Mad Mamluks channel And until next time Assalamu alaikum wa